Maybe it was to the right. It was right there when we took a left to turn around. Maybe it's too. Yeah, it's interesting though. Like you think you would think the highway would be, because we're going back to the same way we came, right? Are we? Well, I mean, twenty. We got off the exit. We got off eighty was for twenty north. Oh, what's twenty north? So we need to go. We need to go. Should we just go back the same we came? Well, that's how I thought. That's how I thought we were doing. No, we we came from that way. Hi, my name is Ingrid. I was born in the Philippines and grew up in Southern Virginia. Now I live in New York City. So I was very fortunate. I grew up in an extremely Catholic home, thanks to my mother, whom, you know, whenever we were going somewhere on vacation, the first thing she always did was figure out where we were gonna go to mass. So I grew up in Southern Virginia, so in the Bible Belt. And most of my friends actually were not Catholic. They were Christian different denominations, and a lot of my experience of the Christian faith, just in terms of living it day, out, day in, day out, were through friends of mine who weren't Catholic. And actually the first time I distinctly remember meeting or encountering the Lord was actually a Christian youth convention in Atlanta, Georgia, in the sixth grade with my best friend and next door neighbor. She had invited me to go with her youth group, so my mom allowed me to go. And I remember, um, I didn't know it was called an altar call, I didn't know what those were, but I remember at the end of the weekend, they invited people to come down to the stage if they wanted to give their life to Jesus, and I knew I had to go. And so that always stuck with me. And then in high school, um, you know, I, was, I, I went to Mass regularly with my family, we always went on Sundays, um, but it wasn't something that we necessarily talked about you know, just over conversation or at dinner. But I had a lot of friends who knew Jesus, seemed to have this personal relationship with Jesus and would just talk about him very casually as if they would, they would always be talking. So I didn't realize at the time, but it really started to plant some questions about my own faith, about the Catholic faith and, and what that really means to have a relationship with Jesus. But why wasn't I really experiencing that within the context of the Catholic Church? And so, um, you know, I went off to college. Thanks be to God, and I'm sure through my mother's prayers, I kept going to Mass. Um, we didn't, I didn't go to a Catholic school, so we didn't even have Mass on campus, so I went off campus. Um, and, you know, it was a blessed time, of course, but I didn't, looking back, I realized I didn't really have a Catholic community at all growing up outside of my family. And I started to wonder, why can't, what is this relationship that they have and why can't I access that? Even though I'm a faithful Catholic, you know, I start, you don't realize, but sometimes the enemy plants these little whispers and you start to think, well, it's still enough, you know, what you're doing. And so in college, I started listening, I started going um, with a friend of mine after mass, we would go to this Christian parish. Their pastor was awesome. They had, they already had podcasts and this was like, you know, in the mid, early 2000s. And so I was, I started listening to them. So that was the first time that I really started to, I feel like get to know Jesus and, and, and understand the need for him in my life in a, in a day-to-day way. Um, and again, I didn't realize at the time, but that planted then another question of, well, I'm experiencing this great thing in my faith that I know is enriching for me, but it's outside of the Catholic church. And so I graduate college. I end up moving to London because I was going to do, uh, I did my postgrad studies there. And again, um, God was good. I went to, I found this Newman Chapel at, at one of the universities. So I would go there Sunday Mass. Um, but I was a little too shy to talk to anybody. So I would just go to Mass and then kind of leave afterwards. My, that, at that point, my community just, I didn't really have one. It was just sort of this Sunday Mass thing. So then in 2010, I ended up moving to New York City. And of course, you know, when people ask you, they're like, oh, you know, what brought you to New York? You just think it's work. That's what I thought it was. I thought it was work. But really, fast forwarding a few years, I realized it's because the Lord needed to evangelize me in my own Catholic faith. And 
for a while, I, I didn't even realize the need because I thought, you know, I've always been to Sunday Mass. I go to confession twice a year. I didn't even realize my own need to go regularly. Um, but in my mind, you know, I'd never had, you know, of course, in high school, there were these moments and periods where you think it's cool to do this and do that and go to parties. So silly. But still thinking that even these small venial sins are okay because you're still a faithful Catholic. You haven't robbed anyone. You haven't been to jail. Um, and so it wasn't until um, I had been seeing somebody seriously for about five years, and I, I sensed that our relationship was about to go to the next um, phase of getting engaged, and something inside of me, I don't even know the word, but I knew deeply that there was something that I needed to do in my faith on my own, and that God was calling me to go somewhere deeper and completely unknown. Um, and so, so I said, okay, Lord, I don't know what that is, but I wanna do it, so help me. I, I'm sure I didn't even know to ask that, but somehow the Lord um, just found a way to do it. So then in 2011, 2012, Hurricane Sandy came through, and I figured, oh, I wanna do something. Surely there must be Catholic people doing this. And then, of course, I'm like, surely there must be young Catholic people my age doing this. So I get on line Google and I found this group. It's called Frasati Fellowship. And they happen to be taking um, a group out to a community to help. And this was the first time I didn't even realize it, that I had started to find other Catholics or actually meet Catholics that were my age um, and that were living, you know, as St. Paul asked us, like a call living a life that's worthy of the call. And I didn't, I didn't know exactly what that meant, but when I met these people, they were on fire for the faith and proud and boldly Catholic and loved it and talked about Jesus outwardly and openly and used their bodies and praised the Lord. And I was like, wait, they're, they're Catholic. They're not non-nominational. They're not this or that, but it was, incredible um, and humbling to see this expressed and experienced within the context of the Catholic Church. Then you start thinking, okay, great, so now I'm Catholic, I have Catholic friends, I'm going to, you know, daily mass, and, and you think you're, you're good and you've made this progress in your faith. Um, and I remember, I think before God really started to break through to me, I was at my first Frasati retreat and I was sitting in the back of the chapel and you know, they invited people to go to confession and I literally sat and thought to myself, Lord, I don't even know why, why I would need to go. Mind you, I probably hadn't been to confession since either that past Easter or that past Christmas. I, I think I, actually, to be honest, I think my first response was a little bit indignant um, because I had a lot of pride that I didn't realize that I had, um, which of course is kind of obvious now, because you know, it's like, you don't think you need to go to confession, who thinks that? I realized as I started to get to know these friends, um, really just in serving with them, in serving the Lord, and in, in planning different activities, you realize you're impatient, you realize you're, you're pretty uncharitable about things, or that you're just completely self-reliant, and um, even though you have friends there who want to help you, you kind of want to do it on your own. Um, but it's not until you encounter these other people um, that you know you sometimes have the opportunity to realize what your own what your own sins and your own faults and weaknesses are. I had this vision. It's like you know when you are watching this movie and you see, I don't know, Bilbo or Frodo, whomever. They're on this huge journey and they see where they need to get through. And they, it, from that angle, it looks so close to them. And they were like, yes, I'm almost there. I'm on my way. It's going to be another day. I've arrived almost. And then the camera starts to pan out. And there's this huge ravine, mountains, terrain that they have to cross. And, and that's, that started, that, that really, I think, when God broke through to me. You know, in this period of getting to know, of getting to experience Catholic friendship, of religious communities in New York City, the Lord was like, my sweet child, you have so much more to go. For a long time, when I had first moved to New York and before I'd found this community, I would go to mass 
and just leave. Of course, like a lot of young adults do because we're afraid to talk to somebody else or approach somebody else when ultimately we are all waiting for that first invitation. Um, I promise you. And I was so blessed that there were a few people in particular who made that first invitation to me, who pursued me in a way that I know and have come to realize that Jesus had been pursuing me. And it was through them, it was through their, their kindness, their warmth, their hospitality. Um, so fast forwarding, I started to become involved in this Catholic community. I say a quick prayer, bro. Here we go. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Immaculate Heart of Mary, cause of our joy, be with us on our way. For all your ways are beautiful and all your paths are peace. Amen. Amen. Good old Patterson, New Jersey. We're on... First left. First left. We don't really come to Patterson a lot. <laughs> gonna take your right at the, the stop sign. Yeah, it's one of those tough neighborhoods. A lot of, a lot of need. This is what many things goes on every day, but this is the first time I've seen. Yeah. This neighborhood streets usually pretty quiet. I was coming in to celebrate mass, and and I turned and I saw it, boom. And I went to that. Oh my gosh! And so I went out to go see if yeah. somebody was hit. Nobody was hit. Could be a gang initiation or something like that. It's a real gun though, they found the casing. Por nuestro Señor Jesucristo, tu Hijo, que vive reina contigo en la unidad del Espíritu Santo y es Dios, por los siglos de los siglos. Amen. Yeah, but when we came down and took a left, we took we should have took a right. That was south was right. We passed that. When we, we took a left, we came back from the friary and passed it. This is why it's hard to live in New Jersey. <laughs> Nothing's ever easy. Yep, 141, 46. Oh. That's when the New York comes out in us and we start to honk, you know? This is in Harlem, you, when you're driving Harlem, you just kind of have to like, You find, can probably roll way. down the windows and be like. You find a way, just kind of like. Just you know, with the head, right? With the head, just, just with, with the head. head. <laughs> boom, boom. Everybody, and then when someone comes by, you're like, with the head. Not in the Midwest though, they don't do that in the Midwest. In the Midwest, it's like, hey, it's like big waves. <laughs> in Harlem, just a point. It's just a head. Ooh, come on. Around Father Innocence, okay, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Put it on the table. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. yeah. There's a little dog here. Or no, it looks like it's a lamb. <laughs> well, praise God, an incredible story of a wonderful young woman, Ingrid. Uh, confession, conversion, her faith, uh, her roots deepening. Mm. St. John Paul II always talks in his Theology of the Body about that time of, of solitude that Adam had. And without that time of solitude, he would not have been able to see Eve as his bride. Mm. And so I think that's like a, a, a paradigm, um, an archetype of a lot of our conversions. It's like we, when we come and discover the Lord, discover the beauties of the Catholic Church, it sometimes goes spring after a winter of questioning, mm. a winter of, of, of looking, a winter of wondering. And, um, and what a blessed thing that, that she had an incredible, incredible experience with an awesome Catholic community. It's interesting. I think sometimes people are afraid to go into to that season in their life um, of just qu of questioning, of, of recognizing we've talked about before, the dissatisfaction in our hearts, that there's gotta be something more you could tell that she, like a lot of things were aligning in her life and she just 
um, she recognized that that there was just some, had to be something more and deeper, right? It was, she was just kind of on the surface, and so she started asking these questions. She she goes on a journey, right? And um, it's it's just beautiful to give people people permission to be in this place. Mm. Um, it's scary. We don't really know what, how. Um, you know, you have to have a lot of hope. Yeah, look at the city. You can't really see much, but it's a beautiful city. We're going from New Jersey into New York, the, the old $15 toll. I, I was driving way. across this bridge with my Pochland director 11 years ago, and he looked over at the city. He said, this, this, could, all be the, this could all be yours for the small price of your life. <laughs> and here we are, living in New York City. Yeah, when we grew up in a Catholic family, my dad converted when we were baptized, and. And so we, you know, went to mass on Sunday and, you know, went to youth group and went to these kind of things. But, but you know, we, we, we did a lot of different things. We did a lot of sports. We did, um, you know, school, obviously school was very important to us. And, um, but you would, it, it was kind of a shock to our family um, that we, they, they, they would have, have two sons that would want to be priests. But it wasn't until high school where we were just super blessed to, to be a part of the diocese where there's just incredible young priests and, and religious sisters that taught in the, in the elementary schools and high schools. And, and, um, and so I remember there's probably like 15 priests that, teach, that taught at our high school. And, um, and these guys are just on fire. Um, I read like all in their thirties and forties and and uh, they just really love the Lord. And, and so just spending time with these priests, I, I just remembered like it was so attractive. And, and I was like, I wonder if I could like, like it was just, I wanted to be like them, right? And, uh, and it wasn't until junior, senior year where I was like, wow, like there's something stirring in my heart that's just deeper than like, oh, like they, I, you know, kind of admiration, but I, I really felt called to, um, to be open to see it, that God was calling me and to, to live the life of a priest. Yeah, for me, it wasn't, uh, I always use the excuse that if Father Innocent was called, that I certainly was not. <laughs> uh, so I had to do, a, I mean, I yeah, had to go. A lot like of the long. heavy lifting before. <laughs> um, but I had a great college experience in Iowa at a small Catholic college there called Loris College and um, was living a, a great Catholic life, I thought, at the time. Um, but it's it quite selfish, um, meaning I was kind of doing everything I always, always wanted to do. And, uh, yeah, kind of living the Catholic life and, and saying my prayers and going to mass and going to adoration. But I was still, when it came to my vocation and my, my, what, what I thought God wanted me to do, I was, it was still kind of like, yeah, it was what I wanted to do. And uh, I used to want to be the White House press secretary. <laughs> that was my dream job. I can't, I, I can't really imagine <laughs> the White House press secretary in these kind of this so current political climate. I wanted to do that. <laughs> and um, I, I just had a college roommate. His friend called me out one day and he just, he said, um, he, yeah, he just said, I, th I think if they wrote a book about your life right now, it would it'd be kind of boring. And I was kind of yeah. offended. <laughs> I was kind of offended. And I said, why do you, why do you say that? He said, because you're, you're a guy that's kind of seemingly living the dream, but kind of just living for himself. And, um, and that was like very convicting for me and really kind of called me out. And uh, yeah, I just realized my I was letting the Lord into my life in some areas, but not in other areas. And um, so it was really great. Um, yeah, it was a good friend to do that. And, and I, I knew I needed to live. It stung a little bit. But is it amazing though, that like if we're selfish and we're closed in, that life is boring. And it's only when we open up to what God, God desires, the adventure that Catholicism is. And, and I mean, you start praying, right? And your life just turns upside down. You start being intimate with the Lord, and then you realize your life just breaks open. And um, I mean, I, I laugh at that because, like, you know, from that moment, like your your life has definitely not been boring. Yeah, not definitely not. <laughs> and it's been a, it's been a wild journey, and it's been you know a journey of having to overcome fears and worries, and and certainly trying to come to terms with what people think. Um, but uh, yeah. That was the beginning of kind of opening myself up for the Lord once. And I always like to say too, Mother Teresa had a great quote that once you, you can't discern on the fence. And once you take a step, there's a lot of grace with that step. 
it's it's kind of like helping young people discern their vocations today. You can't if you can't kind of just be hanging out in a car and just be saying, yeah, I'm discerning. You know, we're the car's got to be going somewhere. We're hanging out in the car. Ingrid had this moment um, where she certainly wasn't living a bad life or a life that you wouldn't look from the outside that, oh, this, this girl has it all together. But something was, like Father said, something was longing in her. When I was alone, it's very easy to just sort of be your own echoing chamber about what you think is right or what you think is wrong. And you start to become your own really kind of standard of what a virtuous life looks like, what a Christian life or a Catholic life looks like. And it wasn't until I was in the context of a community that I could start seeing um, the faults and the strengths, the good and the bad. But sometimes those don't come out until you're, you know, if, if I'm just standing here, right, there's nobody, nothing touching me. So how am I going to know what else, what other boundaries there are? But when you're working with people, volunteering with people, crying, laughing, maybe working through frustrations with people, that's when, that's when you start to understand your boundaries and the places where the Lord really needs to um, grow and heal you. Um, but if you're by yourself, it is very, very difficult to understand where those things are. And, and the Lord and the church wants to give you an, and has a community and has friends to do that with you. So that is your journey to understand your sins, your faults, your the graces that you've given. You have people to um, share those experiences with. She she didn't know it at the time, but she desired to be shaken up a little bit. And this this confession, this concept of confession, to go deeper in confession, to allow the Lord to do to do radical things in our hearts when we come humbly before Him, to give Him not just the sins we might think of all the time, but some of the the, the deeper struggles and the deeper realities of our of our life. When we give those things to the Lord, we're really shaken, and it shakes us to our very core. So what I have held onto as being safe or secure in my life can can those false things those false securities can be put away to where i have more space for the the, the newborn christ to come into my heart you said the word what was what was going on in my heart when you were talking is like more right like mm. god wants more for us and ingrid realized that like she went to confession she said she had that incredible example of like watching a movie and then you zoom out and you realize wow there's a lot more to this like there's a chasm <laughs> she talked about how like you know somehow we have to get over and and like she realized that there was just so much more to her story that she had to she had to like work on. I, I heard somebody say that we can offend God by asking him for little dreams. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Um, what what struck me was that um, she was in Virginia, the Bible Belt. Uh, lots of very vibrant uh, Protestants who were living their relationship with Christ externally compared to a very uh, vibrant Catholic family that would kind of live their faith internally. And then, can you imagine her mom? I was thinking about like, what did her mom think when she said, I'm going to move to New York City and work in the fashion industry? Like, you don't usually hear people discovering Jesus when they come, come to, to New York in the fashion, in the fashion <laughs> industry. I bet you the faith of her mom was just like, okay, Mama Mary, you better send somebody to my daughter to help her. And that's what happened. That's what happened. What a beautiful grace that, um, that she would not only discover her faith, not only become uh, a decided Catholic, because I don't know, it sounded to me like she was wondering yeah. whether she should remain Catholic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not only that, but like, I got to tell you guys, one time I was walking in New York and I see Ingrid on the street corner evangelizing by herself. And I'm like, Ingrid, <laughs> like, what are you doing here? Hi, I'm, I'm inviting people to come into the church. I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> what? Wow. That's amazing. Praise God. Mm. I was just like so edified. And I was actually asking myself like, how come I'm not on the street? You know, <laughs> you, know. you know, but what's beautiful about Ingrid is, and so many people and so many young people we come in contact with, is that um, the faith for her is not just an accessory, mm. accessory to her life. Like you listen to her talk. I mean, she's impressive and she can communicate, but it's kind of at the core of who she is, right? Like, you know, you, you don't go stand on the street corner in New York City and, and invite people to Catholic Underground. Um, if it's not something that you are deeply moved by. Um, and this, again, this is the journey she's been on, this, this growing and the, the roots going deeper and deeper and deeper. 
And this woman is just totally captivated by the Lord. You can tell it the way she speaks and the way um, when she does ministry. Um, so it's just beautiful to see a young person just it's so is is so captivated. I think the core of her desire to go deeper is this is this point she had in confession. Though I think this this desire to make to give the Lord more of what keeps her from experiencing His true life in her. And so I think it's for all of us to say and to invite our um, our viewers to say, what in my life do I need to give to the Lord so my roots can take go go deeper in my life and I may be able to turn into an icon like Ingrid where I can share my faith and my faith can become the core of who I am and I can go out and share that with others. Sounds like an incredible roadmap. Yep. Go to confession, get involved in a community, live your faith. Uh, and let's just talk like, like when we say go to confession, we mean go to confession. <laughs> let's have a good one, you know what I mean? <laughs> You mean we shouldn't go to like McFession? Oh, oh come on. All right. In and out. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I'm like, yo, Father, just give me the penance. <laughs> but that's, you know, sometimes we've all been there. But but I hear you. I hear you. Uh, because it's not just, especially for young people, it's a moment of encounter. Yep, exactly. It's a, it's a profound moment where really, literally, God is listening to you. Amen. It's the sacrament of the millennials. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Keep them coming, baby. We, we need, we need them in there. We need them in there. If you want to come and have your confession heard by the friars, come on over to New York. <laughs> St. Joseph's Friary. Come on down. <laughs> oh, Whoa. come on. Oh. Whoa. Whoa. He's ready. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Come on. Oh. 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 Come on. No, Where are you at? Where are you at? Huh? I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm ready to go. You can pick. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is not going to work. Wow. Praise uh, God. You guys are ready to go. We are ready we are. to go. Um, confession really does have an incredible power uh, to transform lives when you come uh, with, with a sincere heart. We heard how in the life of Ingrid, this is what happened. Um, and if we can maybe just invite, maybe there's someone watching us who hasn't been to confession in a really long time. We invite you, come back to the sacrament of confession with an open heart and watch what God can do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father Angelus, do you want to pray us out? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we just pray in our need and our poverty for you to come into our lives in a deeper way. We come with grateful hearts, Lord. Give us the grace to seek your mercy on the sacrament of confession and the grace for our faith to be, to be radically changed, just like it did in England's life. We thank you, Lord, for your love, your mercy, and we thank you for this holy season to bring us closer to you. And I bless you all in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 So for the person who's at, who might be out there who is afraid to go to confession or hesitant or might not think that you have anything, um, don't be fooled because they're, that's Jesus. That's there waiting for you. He has a message for you, and it's going to bring you closer to him and to who you are. And I'm sure through that experience, he will use that. And it's gonna be not only for your good, but also for someone else's good. Now we're both obviously in final vows, both ordained. And you both, we both could say that our life is definitely not boring, right? Yeah, no, definitely not. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, because it was probably true at the time that I was kind of doing my own thing. And, living for myself and even in the midst of like yeah going to mass and, and praying and but to go deeper and allow the, the lord to kind of yeah introduce himself again and re reintroduce myself to me and now it's funny Andrew, we're working with um just we're working with the young guys in the community as they enter right so it's just like we we're kind of beginning again where it's like we're helping guys or try yeah just trying to help guys be inspired by the grace to give themselves. Um, Absolutely. And not live for themselves, but live for God and live for the poor, you know? It's pretty awesome.